Come on, who's grateful this morning that we serve a God who knows us by name? There's something so personal about your name. Uh, there's something so personal. They even say, like, if you're, like, doing sales, like, name repetition makes people feel like you know them, even if you just met them. And this idea that there's the creator of the universe who knows you by name. Like, that should bring deep comfort. And even when the psalmist wrote that the very hairs on your head are numbered. What that speaks to is like, I've got, I've got three young kids. When my kids are scared, the first thing that they do is they jump on your lap, they curl in a ball. Like that's what scared kids do. And I think when the psalmist wrote, the very hairs in your head are numbered, what he's basically saying is like, hey, if you're going through something tough, if you're going through an uncertain season where life actually is scary, there's actually a, the creator of the universe is basically inviting you in to rest in his lap. He's looking down on the hairs of your head. And he's so close to your reality right now that he actually knows the very hairs on your head. So not only does he know you by name, but he's so intimately acquainted with your pain that he knows the very hairs on your head. That is something that you can take deep comfort in this morning. So Jesus, wherever people find themselves this morning, God, I pray that you would remind them that they know, that you know them by name. Jesus, that you are well acquainted with their pain. I, I, I'm so grateful that the, that the gospel writer wrote that you wept, because Jesus, we need to be reminded that you are acquainted with pain. That Jesus, you are acquainted with uncertain times and uncertain seasons. God, we are so grateful that you have called us, that you have drawn us close. We are so grateful that you know us by name, that the creator of the universe has invaded time and space and has taken out the time to understand me and my pain. God, we are so grateful. Let's sing it together. grateful today, God, that you know us by name. So God, in the uncertain seasons, in trying times, in seasons of great grief, God, we are grateful that you know us by name. And God, even in seasons where everything seems to be going well, God, we are grateful that you know us by name. Remind us that you are the hero of our narrative. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, we want to welcome you to the Father's house. We are so glad that you are joining us today. Wherever you find yourself, we are grateful that you are tuning in uh, to this incredible church service. I'm a little biased, but I think we're the best, so live with that. Uh, awesome. So 2020 uh, is over. Um, which I know if you were in the room, you'd be like, thank God, there'd be a lot of clapping. I feel like I have way too much stuff up here with me today, so this is good. Um, anyway, uh, so 2020 is done. We're in 2021, but we just got to go back, okay? We have to talk about this thing because uh, there's certain things about 2020 that aren't really going anywhere, okay? If you woke up today and you're like, it's 2021, let's head back to church. Uh, obviously, you were mistaken about the reality of a pandemic uh, that isn't going anywhere um, right now. So 2020 did some interesting things to us. For one, it tried to, it tried to force me. didn't happen because I don't give in. Uh, but it tried to force me to be an outdoorsy person um, because we weren't allowed to have people in our house. So they were like, here's what you can do. You can actually go to uh, a park and you can go hiking because COVID doesn't live on the trails. Apparently, nothing should live on the trails, to be honest with you, except plants. But uh, COVID doesn't live there, so let's go hiking. And so my family dragged me. Now I have three young kids. Now at the time, we only had two. We have a three-month-old. Um, and they all would drag me to these insane places where we'd walk through the woods. I don't understand that. 
Um, Because in my opinion, like, I took geography in, like, ninth, tenth grade. So I know Lois and Clark. They did that whole thing so that we don't have to, okay? I appreciate the people who have gone before me. And so uh, I don't hike. But COVID has kind of forced me into this, this state of being uh, that I don't want to be in. And so we, we, went, we went hiking. This, now I'm going to show you. i got some pictures. If you're at the pre-show, uh, Caleb made fun of my scrapbook. But I'm just going to show you. Here's a photo. Look at that. should be on the screen. I think I'm going to look back. I know I'm breaking the rules. Oh, look at that. I don't know if you can see their shoes, uh, but Esther's in boots. Wesley's in rain boots. Uh, and what a beautiful, that's just a beautiful picture, isn't it? It could be anywhere. It's actually at the Bluffs in Oswego. We drove an hour and a half for that photo. Uh, don't understand that, but we did it. Um, here's another one. This is uh, Chloe. Uh, this is my daughter. She's three. She's holding a rock because she wants to remember this. So we're actually at a lake. She's, you'll notice she's in a snowsuit. We're at a lake. Those two things don't go together. But again, we're hiking. So that's what you do. You go to the lake in your snowsuit when you're hiking. Uh, none of this makes sense. Now, uh, here's a, I did get a photo of me. Uh, this is me with my wife. Now, you might think that's an odd picture, but I'm actually doing math in that photo. I'm calculating how much it would cost to just get a pool in my backyard so that we never have to do this again. Because we have like a, we have like a quarantine group, you know, that we'd hang out with. You probably all had that. And so they were with us. It was like Carrie and Kristen and Kim, if you know them. They're like, uh, they're great people. But on a hike, I don't like anybody, so I didn't like them on the hikes. And uh, so this is me contemplating all of life's decisions in that photo. Uh, and now what you don't see in these photos is what we saw when we got there. Because, again, we drove an hour and a half to this, this wretched place. And, like, I don't want to go. Like, I don't want to be, like, I want to spend time with my family, of course, but, like, not there. Like, anyway, like, well, I'd rather sit in the backyard. And so uh, we get there, and, of course, everybody's got to go to the bathroom when you arrive because there's no bathrooms on a hike, and so you gotta go, everybody's got to go. And then out of the path that we're about to go down, there are people walking out, I'm not kidding you, covered in mud. I mean, it is just like, it is, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking around, and nobody in our group seems to have an adverse reaction to this. But, like, I'm, wa- and like, I'm, wa- I'm like, is it muddy in there? Like, I'm asking random strangers as they're coming, like, is it muddy in there? Like, oh, yeah, it's definitely muddy. You're definitely going to get muddy. I look down, I'm wearing fabric sneakers. I'm wearing one of my favorite sweatshirts. I got a Herschel bag on my back. Like, I am not set up at all for a hike. People come out with, like, camelbacks with, like, the water. They're, like, it looks like they've actually climbed the mountain. And I'm, like, I've been duped. Like, you, I don't know this place. I don't know what's in there. I don't know what we're about to get ourselves into. And so then this happens, okay? Because, again, we, we bring young kids on these hikes. And so I'm going to show you a quick video. of, And you have to listen for the sound effects because it's perfect. Okay, here it is. You the first moment, and then once that's done, it's you're just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I really feel like that first one was the worst. Yeah, because there were no uh, side <laughs> trails. Go ahead. Oh. There we go. You hear the grunts? That's all me. It wasn't my six-year-old son. It wasn't my three-year-old daughter. I'm grunting. Now, you would think this is six hours into the hike. No, it's like the first hundred yards in. I'm like, I am done. Like, give me a way out of here. And I would get so mad. Like, I get so mad. I'm, like, looking at my wife. I'm, like, how could you do this to us? And, like, it's, like, this thing. I'm growing in this, okay? But, like, I hate hikes. But the mud was insane. Through almost the entire hike, you're going through mud. But this picture at the end makes it worth it. Like, you need the view. Sometimes there's actually seasons in life where you actually have to go through the mud to get the view. Like, there's actually times in life where you're actually going to be trekking through mud in order to get to the view. In fact, there's only, there's basically only one thing that is guaranteed in this life, and this isn't going to be happy. The only thing guaranteed in this life are problems. The only thing that you can bet your life on is that in this life, there will be trouble. You can actually, you can, you can sell the farm on that reality. That obstacles are 100% guaranteed. But every morning you wake up, your soul is searching for something. Every morning that you get up, your soul is actually longing and building towards something. See, every day your feet hit the floor, you are going somewhere. And unlike the COVID vaccine, we can't just jump into Operation Warp Speed to get there. Like, you actually have to go through the mud in order to get the view. Now, the issue that you and I have as humans is we love to make 
our home in the mud. We love to. We love to hit mud, and once we hit mud, it's like, I can't go any further. I, I, don't know, I don't know how this happened to me. I don't know how I ended up here. I don't know why this is my lot in life. Just waiting for the next thing, wondering, can't 2020 just be over so I can get out of this mud? And then the calendar flips, and you realize, oh, this is just like a construct of society called a calendar to help us keep track of time. It actually has no bearing on our circumstances. And so now, we're, now you're still stuck in the mud, and now you're wondering, is God even there? We're stuck in the mud. And it's in times like that I think you actually have to remember that there's a weight to the weight, but you have to remember that God is still working. Like there's, a, there's actually a weight to the weight. Like the weight that you're carrying and the weight that you have is actually there. It's a reality. There's times where it doesn't seem like God is there. There's times where life isn't adding up. There are seasons in life where it truly feels like you are traversing through mud. That's reality. But you have to remember that all the while, God is still working. There is something happening beneath the surface that God is still doing. But you cannot forget to remember. You have to remember. Now, in light of obsessing with endings, I love endings. That's why New Year's Eve celebrations are always so fun. This year was a little different. It was just my wife and I in my house, and it was like, here we go. It's a party. Uh, and so, like, this year's different, okay? I get it, okay? We wish it could have been differently. Some people ignore rules and just do whatever they want. I get it, okay? I understand. But this year was slightly different. But in general, we love endings. In fact, ABC, if you watch the ball drop, Kind of weird to do it this year. No one's there except Fly Guys. That was odd. Uh, but, like, we are obsessed with endings. So in light of obsessing with endings, because endings make everything better, you can write the best story imaginable. If your ending is terrible, no one wants to watch this thing again. Okay, you can do the best job building character plots and storylines. But if, you're, if you don't land the ending, I'm not wasting my time with this again. So in light of that, I'm going to give you the ending of the story we're going to go through today. The ending of the story is that the Israelites, they make it across the Jordan. Okay? The Israelites do it. It's a big moment. They cross the Jordan. Everybody gets over. There's like three million of them. Okay? There's like three million Israelites. They all get across the Jordan. It's absolutely, um, it's, a, it's amazing. It's, it's an amazing thing. All, they, get, they get across. That's the end. It's the big thing. And some of us, we read our Bible like that. It's like you just, oh, yeah, they, okay, they cross the Jordan. Awesome. Moving on to chapter 5. Uh, but I just want to read you a couple verses out of chapter 4. We're going to start from the end of the story. We're actually going to work backwards in the Bible, uh, which is an odd thing to do. But just bear with me because it all makes sense at the end. So here's what it says in chapter, Joshua chapter 4, verse 4. It says this. So Joshua, he called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. There were 12 tribes in Israel. And he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, heavy rocks, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites. Again, so if you're doing the math, that's 12 stones. Uh, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When across the Jordan... The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Why well, what's amazing? They don't memorialize the destination. You know what's interesting? They didn't get to Canaan and celebrate the fact that they got into the land that they've literally been waiting decades for. They didn't build a memorial to Canaan. He said, I want you to go back into the middle of the Jordan, and I want you to build a memorial about what we just went through. See, they're more concerned with the process than the promise. Way more concerned with what got you there than actually even getting there. Isn't that so interesting? More concerned with the process, not the promise. But they had to do something to remember it by. They had to do something because our memories are far too fickle for our own version of history. They had to do something that screamed about the process. And now what's interesting for my, my family and I for about six years my wife, every year, has done this photo book for my mother-in-law. Now, 
For some of you, you just throw some photos in a book, you package it up, you send it off, and we're good. No, no, not in my house. Around December 15th every year, the energy in the home changes. You know Christmas is coming, that's stressful enough, but the photo book has to get done, okay? And we will wait till the last minute, and we will stress about it. And she's basically, my wife asked her if you know her, she's basically got spreadsheets of the photos that are going to go into this book and the, the painstaking detail. And then she has the audacity to ask me what I think, and which is totally bizarre. It's like step one to a fight. Ask your husband his opinion on something you've been working on weeks for in five minutes. It's like unbelievable. Uh, but so she'll ask me, what do you think? I'm like, Looks, looks great. Uh, what do you want? And so, and so I make fun of it because I take nothing seriously. It's a problem I have. Um, but like every year, it is a stressful time in the house putting this book together. But Esther takes pictures basically every day on her phone. Every year. Every day we take, we take photos, uh, which I love. Okay? And so uh, she takes photos. And then we get the photo book. And there's always the moment when my mother-in-law opens the photo book where it's no longer just about the pictures, right? It's always about the context around the pictures. So it's always this moment where we're, we're actually going back through and talking about the year every single year. The big moments, sometimes the sad moments around the big moments. Everything is memorialized in the photos. See, I can't even remember where I put my keys in the morning, and you want me to be able to recall all the big moments of my life without documenting them, without creating visual cues around what happened in my year, how God actually came through. You see, you need the visual cues, and we're not alone in this. The people of Israel, they didn't have the benefits of an iPhone. They needed the rocks to give them a visual cue. Now, could you imagine if someone came to you today and said, how was your, how was your New Year's Eve? How was your year? Like, that question alone would probably start to cause you to twitch a little bit because you're like, I, how do you even answer what that was like? But if someone sat down and said, tell me about January. What was, tell me the big things in January. I bet you'd have some stuff. You'd probably start to perk up. Tell me about February. Take me through the big things that happened to you in March and April. If someone actually sat down and, and started to ask you detailed questions about what your year was like, I bet you'd perk up a little bit. I bet you'd take some time to talk about some of the devastating things that happened. There'd probably be some laughs. There'd probably be some tears. There'd probably be a lot of anger. But at the end of that conversation, I bet you would see some incredible rich growth that you experienced through this past year. You probably would. But if you don't have a way to memorialize it, it's actually impossible to remember. If you don't have a way to actually memorialize what you're going through, it's impossible to see how God might be working beneath the surface. You cannot forget to remember. Now, the Israelites, they needed the visual cue so that when kids walked by, they could tell their children about the process. It's so important that you set things up so that you can actually tell the future people in your life about the process of God coming through for you when you needed him to most. If you don't, what ends up happening is you actually start to become uh, the, the hero of your own narrative. It's so easy to forget God working when you become the hero of your own narrative. And as a culture that's become obsessed with getting there, we will easily ignore the process. We're obsessed with there. I just got to get there. Where is there? We don't really know where there is, but we know we're going there. But then you get there, and you realize there's more issues there than there were here. So now you need to develop a new there. We always try to skip the process. You know, it's actually possible to be living out your dream. You could be in your dream. This has been the ideal future you have been working towards forever. And you'll simultaneously be living the dream and also experiencing the deepest grief you've ever felt in your life. That can be a reality. You cannot forget to remember that God is still with you. It is so sad when we don't remember the groundbreaking moments because then we become the hero of our own success instead of memorializing the miracles that God created in the process. Now here's the risk of not memorializing what you're building. You forget what you're building in the first place because sometimes it can feel like you're in the mud for a long time. Resentment grows, offense grows. I've forgotten it all together. I, I don't know what we're even doing here. What, why did we do this? Why would we ever make this decision? Why did, we, why did we buy that house? Why did we take that job? Why did we even move here? What were we, th we you forget 
what you're building in the first place. You lose sight of the project that God wants you to actually be a part of when you don't memorialize how God's been working. And then at the end of it all, you quit when it gets uncomfortable. If you don't memorialize the process, you will always choose to quit when life gets uncomfortable. And what's interesting is the amount of work that it actually takes for people uh, to remember things. Because, again, our memories are fickle. So, like, if you think about even 9-11, like, it took so much work for us to not forget that groundbreaking moment. They've built the most magnificent memorial, one of the best museums you could ever go to. And there's people that were born 10 years ago who probably think they lived through it because we've done such a task of forcing people to remember. The amount of work that it sometimes sometimes takes to remember the mud that you have to walk through is significant. But at the end of the day, if you don't memorialize the process, you will never uh, appreciate the view. So how are you memorializing what you came through in 2020? Because sometimes it's in the remembering that actually sustains you in the journey forward. And I would actually encourage you to memorialize the good and memorialize the bad. Don't ignore grief because it just compounds pain. You have to learn to memorialize. And then don't ignore the weight of the weight. Because sometimes, the, honestly, the middle is the hardest part. Don't ignore the weight of the weight. In Joshua chapter 3, I love this. I love this verse. It says this in verse 14 through 17. It says, so when the people, they broke camp to cross the Jordan. The priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan, it's at flood stage. You need to remember that. All during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream flowing, it piled up in a heap a great distance away in a town called Adam. And while the water flowing down to the Dead Sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completely crossed on dry ground. Now, if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to the Old Testament, got to talk about the Ark, okay? You, maybe you've seen Indiana Jones, which gives you a great background on what this thing is. Uh, the Ark for the people of Israel, this is the most precious container that they have. It's the most precious object. This is everything for them. What the Ark represents, it's the actual physical manifestation of God in object form. This is the most important thing for them. The painstaking detail that God gave and the creation of this ark is astounding. Those are the parts, if you read through the Bible, you kind of skim real fast. You're like, if I see one more cubit measurement, I'm going to burn this thing. Like, and so I get it. But the painstaking detail that went into building this thing was no laughing matter for the people of Israel. The length, the width, the height, the weight, the material used, what goes inside of it, everything was extremely important. To make it even more interesting, uh, they built a mobile church, okay? And once a year, a high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, sit at the ark, and meet with God. One person, once a year, would hear from God, come out and speak on behalf of God to the people. This ark represented everything for them. Okay, it also represented God's direction. If they were going to move, the ark would actually be a half a mile ahead of the people so every Israelite could have their eyes on God as they traveled. And so all their traveling would always be dictated by the direction the ark was going with the four Levitical priests that were holding it. Now, the ark weighed about 180 to 200 pounds. So four guys holding it, it's not like light, but it's not, it's not crazy heavy either. But these, this is the, the object that those four priests are holding when they get to the Jordan, okay? And so uh, this is the most important thing that they've ever held. Now, you also have to have a context of who Joshua is in this story. The, Joshua opens, it's one of the best openings in all the Bible. Literally says, Moses, my servant, is dead. You're in charge now, Josh. Have fun. Okay, like, and, and so there are decades of history between Moses and the people of Israel. Decades. Like, the amount of trust that had to be built up is insane. So when these priests, they get to another body of water, everybody knows the story of the Red Sea. Everyone knows. They just got out of slavery in Egypt. They get to a sea, and now there's guys chasing them, 
and there's a sea. They've got kids. They got a lot. They can't swim. What are they going to do? Moses is standing at the Red Sea with his um, with his uh, leaders, and he's like, "All right, guys, this is what God told me to do. I'm going to lift my arms up." Okay, and the guys are probably like, Aaron was probably like, "Are you kidding me? Like, you're going to lift your okay, okay." Let's just go back. We're dead. And, and literally, Moses, he lifts his arms up, and immediately, boom, the sea splits. Could you imagine that moment? And they walk through two walls of water. I mean, my goodness. It would have been, like, unbelievable to look at. And then they get hungry with Moses. People are starving. They're so sick of the food. God literally, Moses asks God, God immediately starts sending manna from heaven. It's raining food for these people. Like all instantaneously, they get thirsty with Moses. What does Moses do? He hits a rock and water literally starts coming from a rock instantaneously. The Israelites have been conditioned to ask for something and God instantly moves on their behalf. And they see it right in front of them. Boom, it happens. So now the priests, Joshua's like, here's what we're going to do. And you get to the Jordan, you're going to put your feet in the water. When you put your feet in the water, Red Sea, boom, dry ground. Check this out. It says that the water was stopped a great distance away. You got to think about this. The Jordan's at flood stage. It's deeper than normal. The priests get in, nothing. They see nothing. They look around at each other like, what did we do wrong? Are we the wrong priests? They go in a little further. Nothing. They're going a little further. Nothing. They're holding the weight of three million people behind them. They're holding the weight of the manifest presence of God on them. The future of their people are on their shoulders. They're standing in water wondering when this thing is going to happen. The awkwardness of the weight must have been so grueling for everyone involved. Nothing's happening. The water was stopped a great distance off. Now, you have to think about this. Let's just say, they say that the city that the water was stopped up in was about 15 to 20 miles away, okay? 15 to 20 miles, water stops. If you're in that city, crazy experience. What is going down? Now, the average river, let's just say it flows at about 7 miles per hour, right? I mean, it's a flood stage. We'll put it at the high end. Let's say it's 7 miles per hour. That means that they're standing in the water waiting for about 2 hours before the water fully recedes. Talk about an awkward wait. The people who are accustomed to instantaneous things happening, the people who are accustomed to walls of water just splitting, now they're standing in water, awkward as ever, wondering, when is this thing going to go down? Now, could you imagine Joshua? Joshua's like, seriously, God? Like, this is my first thing. Just do it. Like, what are you doing? Like, I, these, they're never going to trust me. Like, and then it's, it's at, they wait. For, uh, let's say, two hours. And then the priests are the first ones to start to experience the water moving. They look down and they see the water line on their clothes go down a little bit. And they're probably thinking to themselves, it's, it's happening. I've never experienced anything like this, but it's happening. The weight is worth the weight. Like, but there is a weight to your weight. The amount of waiting they had to do for people to actually, and then the water fully recedes. And it's so interesting that every individual, it says, had to walk by the ark. Think about that. There's millions of people all walking by these four guys after that experience on dry ground. Now, the older people in the community, they probably at least heard about the Red Sea, right? They were well accustomed to great moves of God. They tasted the manna from heaven. They all understood instant gratification. The appreciation the older people must have felt walking by these priests. Like, thank you for continuing to say yes. Thank you for staying strong. Thank you for not giving up. Thank you for holding on. Thank you for carrying the weight for the entire community. Now, the kids in the community, they're probably just happy to be moving again. No realization that what they just experienced is going to benefit them for generations to come. The fact that these four guys stayed in the water while this whole awkward experience passed, those four guys saying yes saved every kid's future in that community. The weight of the weight, you cannot forget about it. There is a weight to your weight, and the middle is generally the hardest part. So what 
is the weight of your weight? What lies to benefit from you saying yes to staying strong? Who is standing in the wake of your waiting? Who's standing in the wake? You know what's so interesting? That the only ones in this story who probably got a little bit muddy were the priests. They had to walk into water. They're the only ones who felt the water. Everybody else, they walked out on dry ground. The only ones that went through muddy were the priests. Now I'm wondering, in what areas of your life have you come through muddy? In what, what areas of your life is God saying, I desperately need you to come through this muddy? I know you don't want to. I know you want to make your home in this pain. But you have to come through muddy. Makes me think, like, what, what's at stake for your marriage staying together? What's, what's at stake for you pushing through and actually finishing college? You might say, I'm the only one in my family who's ever gone. What's at stake for you pushing through and finishing college? What's at stake for you pushing through the broken heart? What's at stake? What's at stake for you to continue to say yes to therapy so you can actually beat depression? What is at stake? Because you have to come through muddy. The only thing guaranteed in this life is that at times you are going to traverse through mud. But can we be a community that can look back and say, yeah, we came through muddy, but we did it so that people behind us can walk through on dry ground. What's at stake for your marriage succeeding? What's at stake for your addiction not grappling you for the rest of your life? What is at stake? Because you can actually come through muddy. You can come through muddy. Now, what's interesting is that as a church, before I lose my place, which I definitely did, uh, as a church, we, we actually came through 2020 muddy. And mud's not even a bad thing. Mud is a badge of honor. Like, you come through muddy, it looks good. You come through something, the ruggedness of the journey, it looks good. And we came through, we came through muddy. Because of my amazing ability to take photos, I got some more photos for you. Uh, I actually didn't take any of these, I don't think. So uh, that, that's not church, but it's also not last week. That was taken in January. Life couldn't have been more normal. There's six of us sitting at a table. You can't do that anymore, just so you know. There's also people sitting on the other side of us. Can't do that anymore. I think there's people on the back side of us. The whole restaurant's full. It's like an infestation, a cesspool, okay? Uh, but we're all there, just no masks, you know, just, un, it's, it's, just it's amazing. It's unbelievable. This is, this, is, this is life in January. Things started to get a little bit interesting. Remember this? That was January First of all, Dan Kim's face in the bottom left-hand corner of that picture just blesses me every time. But uh, that's Chandler Moore worship night. That honestly, if knowing what we know now, if, if someone would have told us what we were going to experience in March, that was already probably the best worship night I've ever been to in my life. Like, that's one of those ones, like, you cry like a baby type worship nights. Like, if we could have just, if we would have known, I wonder how much more, even, even more we would have cherished that night. Like, how much more would we have just, 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 Chandler, if you could just do that, like, one more time. If you could just sing that song one more time. If we could just go through that moment one more time. No one would have picked Easter like this. That's Easter Sunday, 2020, mind you. I took that photo. That's where I stood on Easter Sunday for a church that would normally have thousands of people coming through its doors. I'm in my pastor's basement on Easter doing church. That's mud. It gets more interesting. This year was, in my lifetime, one of the most racial, tumultuous years I've ever experienced. This Sunday was monumental for me. Nicole Doyle's sermon about all the events surrounding this summer. I will never forget them. And this photo truly speaks a thousand words. I'll never forget that. This is also the year we did a backpack giveaway during a pandemic. 
wasn't normal, should, shouldn't have happened that way, but we came through muddy. We still did it. We wanted to reopen. So we, we this, only the Father's house does this type of stuff. We want to reopen. We want to create space so that everybody can experience church. We buy a screen to put outside, not just like a TV screen. That's boring. No, we bought an LED. Look at that thing. It's insane. The first night we put it up, neighbors from across the street are like walking over onto our property. Like, what are they doing here? Like, what? Are, like, we're trying to, we're, we're coming through the mud. This was the first Wednesday. This is one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life, mind you. This sermon, if you haven't heard it, you need to go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just a quick plug. You need to do it. We came through muddy. And it wasn't just that. The kids team, they came through muddy this year. Creating church that everybody wants to attend in a way that everybody can attend. As a church, we came through muddy. Now what's not pictured is the lives that were lost this year. What's not pictured is one of the most politically tumultuous years, again, that any of us have ever experienced. It's not pictured here. What's not pictured is the grief that you are experiencing even right now. The stuff that doesn't make sense. It's hard to get pictures of that stuff, and no one wants to take pictures of that stuff, but it's a reality. And maybe God is saying to you today, you can come through muddy. What is at stake for you coming through muddy? And here's what's amazing. At the beginning of this story, I love this. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, it says, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites, they set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. The Israelites, they set out from Shittim. Now, do you feel stuck today? Do you feel like you've, you've been navigating through the mud for years? Your marriage is stuck. You've given up. Your family's stuck. You've given up. You know, if the Israelites never left Shittim, they would have never gotten to the Jordan. Sometimes you have to leave your shittim in order to cross the Jordan. Do you feel stuck today? You need to make a decision to leave your shittim and cross the Jordan. Do you feel stuck in the mud today? God is saying, I'm calling you to cross the Jordan. I want you to memorialize this moment because we'll never experience something like this again, but you can come through muddy. And you have to be comfortable traversing mud. You have to be comfortable navigating grief. You have to be comfortable navigating the things that don't make sense because God has a view for you, but the only way you're going to appreciate the view is if you get through the mud. So church, my prayer is that we are a dirty community. My prayer is that we are covered head to toe with mud. In fact, we embrace the mud. My prayer is that we become a community that we come alive when we find mud. We become innovative when we find mud. We become visionaries when we find mud. We become evangelists when we find mud. We become desperate for moves of God when we find mud. And when it's all said and done, we will never forget what it was like to come through muddy. So 2021, I can guarantee you it's not going to be normal. I can guarantee you it's going to have its issues. It's January 3rd right now, but in light of eternity, it doesn't even matter. We're here and we're in it. I think today you need to make a decision that you're going to leave Shittim, you're going to traverse mud, and you're going to find the promise of God for your soul. So maybe you're here today, and you know you are stuck. You know you're in it. Every day you wake up and you are defeated before you even begin the day. Jesus needs to rescue your soul. You've lost hope. You've lost all semblance of direction. You desperately need Jesus to save your soul. This morning, today, that can happen. For others of you, you have found yourself in not only just forced isolation because of pandemic, that's become a really good excuse for the isolation you're feeling. But you know that your soul is isolated. 
God wants to help you find genuine and real community. The Levites, they didn't go into the Jordan alone. There was four of them. They had a community. You cannot do mud alone. You need community. So today, I know it might be weird because you're watching on a screen, but I want you to know there's a savior of, his soul, of your soul and his name is Jesus. You know that Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel, God with us is not just a Christmas verse. Guys, those, those symbols are so loud, I can't even hear myself think. Uh, thanks. Uh, the, wow. Uh, but uh, you know Emmanuel, God with us, is not just a Christmas verse. It's not. That is the gospel reality right now. Yeah. Emmanuel, God with us. He is with you in your pain. doesn't have to be December 25th for him to be Emmanuel, God with us. He's with you in your broken marriage. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's with you in your addiction. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's with your wayward son who just doesn't seem to come back. It's Emmanuel, God. He's with your wayward daughter who doesn't seem to want to come. It's Emmanuel, God with us. So right where you're at, you know you need a Savior. And his name is Jesus. You know you have to admit that you've been stuck in mud for years. You need a Savior. I've said the prayer before. It doesn't matter. You desperately need a Savior. So right where you're at, you can say this prayer with me. Jesus I need you to come to my mud. I need you to help me. Jesus, I need you to save my wayward and lost soul. Jesus, you remind me of what I'm moving for. Jesus, you remind me of what I'm traversing the mud for. Jesus, forgive me for making my home in mud. Jesus, forgive me for getting stuck in my own mind. Jesus, today and right now, help me to come through muddy. You become Emmanuel, God, with me in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, we need to be able to connect with you because I understand what it's like. You say that prayer. I've said it so many times growing up. You say the prayer and like, it's like, okay, let's go about my day. No, you need to connect with somebody. You desperately, this isn't even just a sales pitch. This isn't just a program that we have. If you do not have community, I can promise you this one thing. There's one thing I know will happen if you do not have good, godly community. You will 100% of the time make your home in mud. It'll always happen. You'll be dirty for nothing. Do you realize even the prodigal son, he was in a sheep's pen, muddy as anything. And he came to his senses and he came home muddy. And his father hugged him. You desperately need community. You need people around you who are going to support you. People around you who when you're ready to give up and walk out of the Jordan, they're going to be like, what are you thinking? Look at all the people behind you. Keep going. Like you need people around you. So I cannot stress enough join a freaking group okay people do it find a community of people who are going to go through mud with you and i promise you your life will be better for it so jesus we thank you that you are with us we thank you that you're with us in our pain and in this moment i pray that our church would never be the same god i thank you that we are a community that always says yes to getting muddy God, I thank you that we will continue to be innovative, that marriages will continue to be restored, addictions will continue to be broken, depression will continue to cease because we are a community that says yes to the mud. Help us not to forget you moving in our midst. Help us not to ignore the weight of the weight. Remind us of who we are moving for. In Jesus' name, amen.
Listen, in all of our locations, platforms, online, in the Zoom, if you prayed that prayer with Pastor Josh, I want to encourage you right in the chat. Just put, I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. Our hosts are going to get in touch with you. We want to walk with you through the mud. That's what we're here for. And that's, as a church, uh, what we're all about. Because every single one of us, uh, we're, we're, we're going to and from the mud. And uh, we want to walk with you. And uh, you want to get into community. Like Josh said, just text TFH groups to 313131 or put it in the chat. I prayed that prayer. I need community. I prayed that prayer. I need community. Start off this year right. Now, I want you to stay tuned for Behind the message, Pastor Josh, Caleb, and Carrie are going to be out at our news anchor desk. I think they're going to debrief that message a little bit. I think Josh underplayed. Uh, the, that was an incredible message, by the way. But I know that he held back in one area. And and because uh, we were texting uh, last night about it. Like, you have to leave shit him. He definitely pulled back on that one. God has an incredible sense of humor. You, you got to leave shit him for the mud. What, what an incredible sense of humor God has, right? So I know that he's probably going to get into that behind the message. So stay tuned. We're going to go there in just a second. Don't forget about First Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, live, all of our platforms, 7 p.m. Update about how we're doing as a church, what to expect with opening, reopening. What does 2021 look like for us? And an update on how we did the Christmas offering, how we closed out 2020. We love you, church. Stay tuned for Behind the Message. See you soon. What an incredible service. Here's the man, the myth, the legend, getting ready. He was running late, but we forgive you because that was a great message. Such a good message. Oh, oh. yep. Eh, you know. For those watching, these in-ears are quite something to put on. <laughs> After hearing those symbols, your brain can't think to put those in-ears in. Hey, you've got a mic. I got to say, though, I feel like the quote of 2021 is join a freaking group that made me so happy because there was such New. conviction in your voice yeah. i loved yeah. it the uh <laughs> those symbols were so loud i was um busy focusing on the word memorializing hmm. for some reason that one doesn't roll off the tongue and you said it many times i said a lot very well yeah it was memorializing hard. the memory say that three times yeah, fast. You honestly i have a question for you josh how did you like uh I'm so out of shape. I ran. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. How did sorry, I what? So sorry. Yeah. Okay. I love that you told the story backwards. Yeah. What made you? Uh, creativity. Yeah. yeah. Creativity, really. But no, I feel like the ending of the story, everybody knows. And I felt like I, there, I felt like it worked well to start with mud with my daughter. Yeah. End with mud oh, with the priest. And then so I really great. wanted to. The, the, I was really excited about leaving your shit in, but as I'm saying it, I was like, you know what? I think I need to stop saying that. Um, <laughs> on another note, because I've been watching an insane amount of TV, I'm going to ask them first and then you guys. Um, post in the chat, what has been some of your favorite TV shows up until the ending? And then it just Ooh. ruined it for you. Any Ooh. immediate thoughts? For me... I don't watch the last episode of most shows. I don't either. Because there's something in me that doesn't want to end the show. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have complete control over that as long as I don't watch the last episode. Mm -hmm. That's a good, I mean, so there's a show that I watched and I've watched it, I think, three or four times. That huh. show is Breaking Bad. Oh. I am obsessed with that show. I think it starts well. I think it ends perfect. You literally did not answer my question. What'd you say? At all. What you ask? the opposite. So what? What's a show? What's a that great show you loved up until the end? Oh, of the I'm well. I'm trying to tie it into your great message. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there is one of those. Yeah, there is. There is one of those shows. There's lots of them. Yeah. I know. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me uh, is Game of Thrones. Yes, the fans were enraged. I actually just got sent a text message that. As a result of how that show ended, which I don't even recommend, by the way, because it ended so horribly, uh, they lost half of their adult viewers, HBO. What is it even? Oh, like subscribers? Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Friendly, yeah, because it ended so bad. Anyway, <laughs> so that was one of the shows. The Office, I think, uh, kind of yeah. went the whoop. Yeah, another. Yeah. Parks and Rec held me to the end. Oh, I love that show. In the chat, post what post is that? 
That show started well, ended horrible. Some people say Sopranos never seen it though. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't watched a single episode. Adri yeah. watches that show and loves that show. Huh. Now, Josh, um, as you have been doing so much for online in this season, um, and this pre-show's kind of mm. been your baby as well as the behind the message. Um, I think it's only appropriate that I acknowledge we still have Christmas trees behind us. Yeah. They exist. It's cold. They're evergreen. It's still on theme. Yeah. Except next week we I we're not I can't do it. No, we can't. What what's your thoughts? What are you thinking? Oh Oh, what can the people look forward to? Oh, something new. Something new. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Something new is gonna be awesome. We're gonna bring in twenty twenty one properly on January (laughs) tenth. So the how, only way I have yeah. no thoughts. This is you. Neither. Yeah, I don't have any thoughts yet, but they're they're ruminating. Wow. Okay, now coming back to your message, I know Luke mentioned it, and we talked about it in the welcome. But Carrie, um, was such a great push for groups that Josh did. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just explain the easiest way to sign up for groups? Yeah. Um, for those for who sure. are interested. Yeah. So if you're still watching in the chat, you can literally just put it in the chat. I want to join a group, or you can text TFH groups. That's all one word, no space to thirty one thirty one thirty one. And it will most likely be me. I'll be texting you back, asking you some questions, help you fill out a form, just so we can help match what you're looking for with availability. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, your 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 thingy. Anyways, um, and yeah, and it'll be they great. They can see you. What do you mean? Like everybody? Okay, yeah. No, I know. We're I live. I, I know. <laughs> okay. I, know I thought people would be wondering what is this. <laughs> um. Anyways, moving on. Yeah. So that's that's how it works. And honestly, there's so many different types of groups. A lot of groups are meeting via Zoom right now because the world is zooming. But it's really nice because you get to meet people from all over the country, which is pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. It's really exciting. Something I'm also excited for is first Wednesday. That's yes. coming up this Wednesday. Uh, in the pre-show we mentioned, this is the first, first Wednesday of the year, and it's the first Wednesday of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be an incredible night. Our teams have been working on it for a while now, but we're excited as we look forward to um, just beginning to kind of pay forward uh, what 2021 is going to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Josh's message was a really great precursor yeah. um, to the season that we're headed into as a church and as a family, um, and we're also going to spend some time celebrating and seeing where we're at with Christmas offering. Um, as we know, Christmas offering um, is to fund the God dream that we have for 2021, mm-hmm. as well as ongoing support for our Life Center um, that's been doing an incredible job in this season. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that's really exciting that we have every week, Carrie, do you want to let them know a little bit about prayer? Oh, yeah. So prayer, literally every single Saturday, 8 a.m., ever since I've been coming here for, I don't know, like 12 years. 12 years. I think so. I'm not sure. I I think it's 12 years. Uh, Almost six. Oh, yeah. You infant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you forever. 21. 21. You are like a vet. Do you remember when your dad kind of put the stake in the ground and was like, yo, I'm not preaching anymore until we start praying? No. I've heard it. Don't personally remember. All right, it. well that's fine. You were but probably small. It was a great. Keep going. That was a but really good. But for the great. people that's at great. home, yeah. what you need to Train know, the story goes that one Sunday, Pastor Pierre was like, "Listen, I literally refuse to preach another message until we come together as a church and start praying for our communities and for the Word of God to bring revival." I love that story because it's so Pierre. That's great. So that's what he did, and ever since then, we have prayed every single week. And what's amazing right now is you can join every Saturday via Zoom. And pray for your family and our community. And we know that uh, that prayer kind of fuels everything. So honestly, I keep saying this. Mark your day in calendars, people. Set an alarm because you won't get up for prayer unless you do that. Josh, do you put stuff in your calendar? Are you a calendar setter? Oh, he's you know, probably the king of calendars. I Really? I go, I ebb and flow Is that between like. because I can't imagine that. No. no. What? Not at all. Depends I just, on the season. Sometimes I do, one who keeps a great calendar is my wife. Yeah. If you've learned oh, yeah. anything today, who's, it's who's that right I have zero there? control over my life, and uh, <laughs> Esther is very good at keeping me all together. <laughs> but I do have a calendar. Yeah, I don't do the best at it. The only time things get added to my calendar is when I like schedule an appointment online, and it immediately says, "Do you want to add this to your calendar?" Are you serious? Yes, Carrie. It's a calendar. I don't use it for anything I other than. Live like, and what day die is Easter by my this calendar. Year. Do you use reminders? No. Oh it's all my in my brain. God. That's just oh. my brain is a chaotic yeah. place. Somebody help me. <laughs> Anyways, these two. with a few seconds left, you weren't here during pre show. I feel like I'm asking Carrie all the questions. But can you just tell us a little bit what it's like to celebrate New Year's multiple times for every time zone? Let me tell you, Northeast? people at home, I am not, I, I'm a morning person, I'm not a nighttime person. 
And uh, at New Year's Eve, my, my roommate Kristen was like, well, it's New Year's, but it hasn't been New Year's in Pacific or Mountain Time or the Rockies. So we stayed up until 3 in the morning, and I paid for it because I am old. That's incredible. But now we get to celebrate the new year for yeah. the next 362 Woo! days. Two days. I think I did yeah. the math wow. right. I think so. Hey, church family, we love you. What an incredible first Sunday of the year. We'll see you at First Wednesday, Saturday morning prayer, and excited for the new season that's ahead of us. Pastor Pierre will be preaching next week. So we'll see you. We love you. Have a great day, church.